When Indiana Jones and friends rode off into the sunset at the end of The Last Crusade, both audiences and the team behind the project, Spielberg, Lucas, and Ford, figured that would be the last we'd see of the fedora-wearing archaeologist. But after Harrison Ford guest starred as an older Indiana Jones in an episode of Young Indy, it gave Lucas an idea for a fourth movie set in a later time period. Lucas surmised that since the first three films were inspired by 1930s Saturday serial matinees, that the fourth film could be inspired by the sci-fi B-movies of the 1950s, giving him the idea of using extraterrestrials. As you can imagine, both Ford and Spielberg shot down the idea. But Lucas persisted and went ahead and hired a couple of writers to pen a draft of what would be titled Indiana Jones and the Saucer Men from Mars. This would eventually evolve into The Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, but there would be many different iterations of the script before we got there. So let's dive in and take a look back at what could have been Indiana Jones 4. We all know Indiana Jones was partly inspired by James Bond, who was famous for having a romance with a new woman in every picture until On Her Majesty's Secret Service when James Bond did the unthinkable. He got married. This film feels like the Indiana Jones version of that because, you guessed it, Indiana Jones finally gets married. After meeting a beautiful and cunning linguist in Borneo by the name of Elaine McGregor, the two fall madly in love and decide to wed. Now you may be asking yourself, what's the MacGuffin in this film? We've had the Ark of the Covenant, the Sankara Stones, and even the Holy Grail. But in this film, Indy will find himself searching for his wife. And that's because she leaves him high and dry at the altar with another man. Baffled, Indy pursues in his just-married car, dragging tin cans behind him. This scene would eventually evolve into the college car chase across campus in Crystal Skull. Anyway, after she gets away, Indy returns to her office and, after snooping around, discovers that she's really a U.S. government spy, the man she left with was her ex-husband, and there are clues that they went to a military base in New Mexico, right near, you guessed it, Roswell. And with that, we're off to the races on Indy's weirdest adventure yet. Without going into too much detail, this movie basically turns into close encounters of the third kind. There's an alien crash site where they recover a handheld cylindrical device with markings and dead languages all over it. This is the real MacGuffin, by the way, and it's what everyone is after, including the Russians, who are the primary antagonists here. What this device is or does is never really explained. There's flying saucers, giant spider-like aliens that are actually robots, other smaller bug-like aliens, Indy even talks to one of them with the help of his linguist fiance, and all the other hallmarks of an Indy Jones movie we've come to know and love. The film finally climaxes at a mountain, similar again to Close Encounters, where the aliens take the device back before flying off in their spaceship and leaving no trace behind. The film ends with Indy marrying this Elaine person in a scene similar to the end of Crystal Skull, except when they get in the car to leave, we see the driver as a familiar face. Short round, step on it. Okie dokie, Dr. Joe's home with your potatoes. As Lucas and his writers got closer to having a finished script, Independence Day came out and beat them to the punch. I called George up after I saw the movie and said, hey, this movie's really a lot of fun. It's brilliantly directed by Roland Emmerich. It's just got everything you want in a movie. It's got humor and it's got drama. It's got things you've never seen before. It's got a mothership bigger than my mothership in Close Encounters hovering over a city in broad daylight. I said, come on, we can't do Aliens, especially since Roland has done his alien picture. So the script and idea were shelled, and it's probably a good thing too, because if I'm being honest, I can't believe I'm about to say this, but I think what we got with Crystal Skull was considerably better. Plus, this version of the film leans way too heavily on aliens, basically becoming a sci-fi flick by the third act. Fast forward several years later to the American Film Institute's tribute to Ford, which saw Spielberg and Lucas in attendance. Together, the three men decided that they wanted to make another Indiana Jones movie together because of all the fun they had making the previous three films. Oh, this is the way I make my living. This is what I do for a living. Lucas, still adamant the film feature aliens, dusted off the Saucer Man script and handed it over to Frank Darabont, writer and director of The Shawshank Redemption, to pen the next draft, which he titled Indiana Jones and the City of the Gods. I have to say, what a title. Now this script is pretty similar to Crystal Skull. It hits many of the same beats, but there are a few major differences which I think are for the better. First, there's no Mutt Williams, no Mac with his endless heel and face turns, and no Spalco. Marion is back, but her characterization is much closer to what she was like in Raiders. Her and Indy have great banter together, and the first time she sees him, she socks him in the face. She's also married, and not to Indy, but to a rival archaeologist named Belasco, who we eventually come to learn is a communist spy. Now, I know what everyone's wondering, is the nuke the fridge moment in this version too? And the answer is yes, but, and this is a big but, it actually is a setup for one of the themes of the film. After the incident, while Indy's being 
being interrogated by government agents, he argues that nobody should have the A-bomb and worries that humanity lacks the wisdom for that kind of power. This will come back during the climax of the film, which we'll get to in a moment. But speaking of other cringe moments, yes, the vine swinging is here too. But like the fridge, it makes a little more sense in this version of the script, which sees Oxley swinging from vine to vine like an animal and Indy clumsily trying to keep up. Keep in mind, Oxley is completely insane at this point in the script and almost animalistic. So him swinging from vines actually kind of works. Fast forward to the climax of the film where Indy, Marion, Ox, and the villains place the crystal skull atop one of the crystal skeletons. Immediately, Jones and the villains are lifted into the air, surrounded by a cloud of vapor that is coming out of Oxley. The alien, talking through Oxley, then offers the men anything their hearts desire. One wishes for ultimate power, the other ultimate wisdom, and so forth, until we get to Indy, who is hypnotized and stunned by the swirling promise of all the knowledge in the cosmos. It's at this point that he faintly hears Marion calling to him from beyond the cloud, begging him not to leave her. It takes everything he's got in him, but Indy turns and looks back to Marion as he's released from the dream cloud, dropping to the floor below. The rest of the men are immediately destroyed by the thing they craved as the mummified alien begins to come back to life, restored by the life force it stole from the now dead men. In a callback to the atom bomb earlier in the film, Indy then shoots the crystal skull to deny any creature that much power, which starts a chain reaction as the temple begins to break apart around them. Furious, the alien grabs Oxley, who is now back to normal, and begins to suck his life force out too. But not before Indiana Jones takes a and says something right out of Independence Day. Welcome to Earth. Indy unloads his entire clip into the alien before grabbing Ox and Marion as the three hightail it out of the collapsing temple. As it ascends towards the heavens, the ship struggles to take flight and crashes, exploding into a giant mushroom cloud. See, if atomic energy isn't even safe in the hands of what are, to us, godlike beings, then surely they can't be safe in our hands either. It's all a big metaphor for man's hubris, but of course Indy didn't need to survive a nuclear blast hiding in a flying refrigerator to make that statement. After reading this draft of the script, Spielberg proclaimed it the best script he's read since Raiders of the Lost Ark and wanted to begin shooting immediately. Lucas, on the other hand, was less enthusiastic. We're not going to do the movie unless all three of us agree on it. After rejecting it, Darabont told Lucas that he thought he was insane for doing so. But George apparently didn't blink and Darabont called him one of the most stubborn men he knew. They're really partners in this, you know, in, in this effort, in the Indiana Jones effort. So but both of them have to be on board. So that kind of reset the project back to more like square one. Following this, the script went through the hands of a few more screenwriters. Somewhere along the way, Spielberg pushed back again against the whole aliens thing, so Lucas found this workaround to convince him. He said, okay, these are interdimensional beings. They're not extraterrestrials, they're interdimensional. So I said, fine. Although it seems like he just finally warmed down. I think it's a real shame the Darabont script never got made. Not only did the climax pack quite a punch, but during the wedding at the end of the film, when Marion asks Indy what he saw in the dream cloud, he tells her that he saw her and that she's his fortune and glory. Now that, my friends, is an ending. Until next time, please hit that subscribe button so you can, well, you know the drill by now. Thanks for watching, everybody.